we are recording. Okay. Um, if you guys could do me a favor, please open up your cameras. If your technology allows, it does help me to see who I'm talking to. I don't feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, and, and genuinely, I hope everybody's doing all right. I hope everybody had a good weekend. I hope everybody's family is good, healthy, and safe. Um, so let me kind of provide you some context. Let me provide you my notes for what I found of interest for the reading. And then um, we'll jump into our fishbowl and we'll jump into our course conversation. So the book is entitled um, Mules and Men. Um, the author, her name is Zora Neale Hurston, um, world renowned author. Um, one of her more famous texts is Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, Their Eyes Are Watching God. It was, I believe, adapted to a film, um, award-winning text, very popular. Um, so Hurston is an anthropologist. Um, she studied anthropo anthropology, right? Um, she studied under Franz Boas. So if anyone familiar with the study of anthropology, American anthropology in particular, then I'm sure you've heard this name, Franz Boas. He's considered the father of American um, anthropology. And this is who Zora Neale Hurston studied under, OK? Um, she stayed at Howard. Um, Howard University, the HBCU. She earned her bachelor's degree in anthropology from Bernard College for Women in Columbia. Um, then she studied anthropology at Columbia University, and that's where she studied under Franz Boas. Um, the text, Mules of Men, um, it was published in 1935. It's an autobiological text. It's a collection of folklore and stories that she accumulated throughout her time spent in Florida, um, Polk County, Florida, and Edenville, Florida, to be specific, and then um, New Orleans as well. So those are the areas where she was able to gather these stories that you find within the text. Um, she started working on the book in this, on December 14th of 2027, sorry, 1927. Um, the book was published in 1934, 35. Um, so then, you know, this notion of folklore, this course is the African oral tradition, Folklore is a part of that oral tradition. So I'm gonna provide you guys a definition for folklore and you'll see how this kind of plays out within the text. It's an expressive body of culture shared by a particular group of people encompassing the traditions common to that culture, right? So it's shared culture is what a folklore is. Um, and it's, a, it's shared by a particular group of people who are within that particular culture. Um, write this down. This is a framework for today's lecture, right? So I talk about in the past, we'll be using theoretical frameworks. One of the first frameworks that we um, utilized was African-American male theory. This framework, and I believe I mentioned this before, is funds of knowledge, okay? So the framework, the framework that this lecture will be operating under is considered funds of knowledge, F-U-N-D-S of knowledge, okay? And that is defined how knowledge, and cultural nuance is passed from one generation to the next by family and community. So funds of knowledge is how knowledge and cultural nuance is passed from generation to generation by family and community. One last time, funds of knowledge is how knowledge and cultural nuance is passed from generation to generation by family and community. Right. So if you take what the theoretical framework is, and if you take the definitions of folklore, you see that folklore is a component of funds of knowledge. Does that make sense? So just as I articulated the definition for funds of knowledge, how we understand folklore can also be understood as a funds of knowledge, as a component of funds of knowledge. Does that make sense? So that's the framework that um, the reading today will be working through. So my notes on the text, this idea or this notion of telling lies, right? Telling and lying. So it's an aspect of the oral tradition as well, okay? So that's something that I want you guys to be aware of and, and I was attentive to. Um, we already provided you a definition of folklore. Um, so you have an understanding of what that is. Um, I also noticed how in the stories, the elder in the story is referred to as dad, right? Um, this is also part of the African tradition um, one second. Yeah, yeah, do what you have to do, Isis, no word. Um, so, so 
so the dad, the, the elders being referred to as dad, right? This is also a component of the African oral tradition or just African tradition period. Anyone, anytime that you are dealing with an elder, right? You would refer to that elder as Baba, right? Which essentially translates to dad as well. So it's a way of showing respect. It's a way of showing reverence for those who came before you. Um, then there's this, um, the story of the bear, the lion, and the king of the world, right? So within that story, there's stories of subversion. Um, who knows what subversion means or who does not know what subversion means? Okay. I don't know what subversion means. Okay. So to subvert an authority, right? So um, subversion would be, let's just say you're out, right? You get pulled over by the police, right? You may have a warrant under your name. Y'all know what a warrant is, right? So if you have a warrant, they're able to take your ass to jail, right? So if you have a warrant under your name, you get stopped, you get pulled over by the police. Um, when they ask you, you're, you're not driving though, you're in the pastor seat, okay? And they ask you, what's your name? You tell them, I don't have an ID on me. And you tell them your brother's name because your brother don't have a warrant, right? So what you done was you were able to subvert the law. Right. So by you providing the police officer of false information, you were subverting the law and you subverted their ability to take you to jail because of the warrant that you have. Right. So it's means and mechanisms that people do to undermine, to work around, right, to um, rebel against certain laws, certain authority figures and things of that nature. So do you understand what I mean when I say by this no this notion of subversion? Right. Um, Think about how the story, how the, um, the, the, the rabbit was able to outsmart the lion, right? Um, that's in a subversion. I'm sorry, the, the bear was able to outsmart the lion. And then the lion had to kind of outsmart the man, right? So this is a subversion, right? How do you outwit someone who has an authority over you? So this is part of that story, the, the bear, the lion, and the king, um, and the king of the world. It's a story of subversion and outsmarting and outwitting your enemies or your or an authority figure, okay? Um, and then they go into the story about how to eat, how to eat fish, right? And, and I, I wonder, what's the significance of them telling the story on how to eat fish? Why does that become of importance to the point that she wants to place this in the text, right? But Think about what, spoke, what folklore and what funds of knowledge is supposed to do, right? Pass knowledge down from generation to generation. So how to eat a fish is a certain type of knowledge that these stories are passing down from generation to generation. Um, and then in, within that story, right, um, you have Dad Boykins who agrees with the science of eating fish, but then he adds his own layer of information on there on like how to keep warm, right? So when you come in from a long days of work, how to sit where by the fire to make sure that you're warm, right? So that's another layer of knowledge that the um, elders are passing down, right? And it comes with this notion of the wind climbing up your back at night, right? So again, the way that she uses her method, right? she's able to articulate these stories and these narratives that the people in the community that she's studying, that's how they help make sense of the world, right? So this notion of the wind climbing on your back at night, it just describes being cold, right? But that's the, within the lexicon and within the dialect of the people that, they're, that she's studying, these are the type of terminology that they use, right? And then um, I was also attentive to the preacher's story uh, in the sermon, and then this is just, the storytelling of a creation story is really what the preacher is articulating through his story, right? So again, uh, an understanding of how the world was made was being produced through this folklore. So these are some of the points of emphasis I found within the text. Um, we'll move to our fishbowl. Again, you could talk about what you guys discussed in your breakout rooms. You could discuss, uh, you could talk about what was discussed in my brief lecture or anything that you found of interest. Um, is there anybody who wants to volunteer for the uh, fishbowl? I will. Uh, Alex? Yeah. Uh, anybody else? All right. So um, since no one else is volunteer, I'll, I'll um, call at random two other people to participate. And then once we got three, we'll be good to go. 
Um, remember, you have one time to pass. Um, and then again, anything that you found of interest in the text, anything that I mentioned in this lecture or anything that was discussed during the breakout groups. Um, Claudia, are you prepared to fishbowl? Um, yes. Okay. And one other person, um, Jenny, are you prepared to fishbowl? Um, can I skip for this time? One second. So just know that this is the your one pass for the sem semester, Jenny. Um, I don't know the name, but on your handle it says the goat. So um, I'm, I'm I'm saying that because it's all I got to go off of. Um, so I don't know who I'm speaking to, but is the goat ready to uh, fishbowl? Uh, that that's me, uh, John. I'm I'm almost home though. Um, so are you prepared to do it? I can have you go last, so that way it gets some time for you to get home. Oh, honestly, I'm a little, uh, I guess I'll, I'll pass for today because I'm not really like, prepared for that right now. All right. So one more then. Uh, uh, Ms. Gaston, are you, have you fishbowled already? And if not, are you prepared to fishbowl today? You said me. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I already did two fishbowls. Okay, so you're good for the semester. Um, you clock. Dwayne, you already went. Jasper, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, yeah, I can. Okay, so you'll be the last one. So for today, we have Alex, Claudia, and Jasper for a fishbowl. Um, whoever wants to set it off, it's on you. Yeah. Um, the thing we talked about in our breakout room, uh, what I thought was like kind of interesting about the story was like the way she wrote everything, and how we thought it was like uh. I know uh, Carla was talking about how, um, or was it Claudia? I don't remember. But what they were saying, like how it, it seemed like it was a like it was a different language. Yeah. Cause, and so so think about um, think about what you just said, Alex, and prepare as it pertains to last week's reading, right? And how um, this notion of being bilingual, right? And I said that yeah, we have the, the English and Spanish speakers. But I'm not going to let Black folks off the hook in the sense of y'all being bilingual too and the ability to speak Ebonics and, you know, standard English. This is a, a text that's written in Ebonics, right? So it, it almost does sound like a, another language, right? Um, but this is, and then keep in mind too, right? This is, one, one, before I even go there, not only the time, has anybody spent any time down South? Like Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, no? to Tennessee. Um, so when you go down South, there is literally a different dialect. People sound different, right? So that's one component at play. Also at play, this is written in 1935, right? But she was doing the research in 1927. So keep in mind the time as well. So not only the location, the deep South, but the time as well. Who's next? I'll go next. Um, I think I just want to talk about what you mentioned about the fish. Okay. Um, I think it's just symbolizing the importance of substance and how to like um, just symbolize because I'm referring off the Bible when um, Jesus made it rain fish and um, wine for all the sailors and everything. It just kind of resembled that in a sense. Okay. And also I have a question um, for the fishbowl. I have gone a couple times actually, like I think about four or five times already. For the fishbowl? Yeah, they've um, all appeared a couple times. Okay, so what I'll do, Claudia, um, let, I'll look for your name and I'll look at my notes. If you went more than twice, then you just get extra credit for the time that you went over twice, okay? Um, and then going forward, just don't volunteer or if I call on your name, just let me know, yo, I already went. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Um, and so the last person to fishbowl is Jasper. Yeah, so um, for the reading, um, when you gave the question before the breakout group, like what's the thesis for the text? 
Uh, I couldn't really find it really because I was more paying attention to the way of storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I think it's more of a how to give lessons through stories. And like how you said, the pass down traditions or whatnot. And like at the beginning of the story, they were talking about, oh, no one could beat the lion. And he was like, I don't think you told me this one before or something like that. Or he was heard it different. Yeah. And then they gave the story of how, oh, yeah, the lion thought he was the king. But until he met the John riding the horse. Right. So I think it's more of a, and then after that, he was like, oh, yeah, the young people don't want to listen or whatever. And then I found it interesting how later on the uh, young people were asking more like, oh, you said this, how do you do this? Or how do I get warm and stuff like that? So that's what mainly stuck out to me. Yeah. So just to kind of re- recap and rephrase what you're saying, Jasper. Um, one, you know, the thesis wasn't easy to pin down. And, and I, I completely agree with you, right? It, it wasn't a very clear argumented thesis, right? Because the, the nature of this book is slightly different. Um, so I absolutely agree with that. Um, but then this idea of passing messages through story, right? And then this notion of the, the younger individuals within the community asking the elders, yo, well, tell me about this story so I can know how to do X, Y, and Z, right? So again, the transferring of information from generation to generation that's being done through story, right? Think about, and then think about in our generation, in our, in our time too, right? Um, all, a lot of you are, are in, in school, so you're scholars, right? So you're doing reading and things like that. But for people who are outside of school, by and large, this is, this is not a reading culture, okay? This is not a culture that, that gets our stories by reading. We get our stories through the television and we get our stories through movies, right? Same things at play. So there's stories and there's messages that are being pl- passed through these movies, right? How many um, movies are derived from actual books, right? So again, it's this telling of the stories from generation to generation. Um, random example, but over the weekend, I watched Coming to America 2. Anybody familiar or heard about this? Eddie Murphy, uh, Arsenio Hall? Nah. Um, and then the reason why I brought this up is because this is a remake, not a remake, it's a sequel to a movie that was done 30 years ago, right? But with, And what they do in the sequel is they put elements of the first movie in there, right? So that way, for those who didn't see the first movie, you kind of know what's going on or, for, um, or also to make you kind of want to go back and, and see the first movie, right? But what I'm also understanding, somebody who's seen the first movie and seen the second movie, is what you would call like a cult classic, right? Um, they're passing these stories down to a new generation of people to be o- exposed to the story that Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall is seeking to tell through this coming to America narrative, right? So these are ways to pass down these culturally relevant stories from a generation to a generation. Um, Dwayne, Jasper, Have y'all seen Coming to America or heard of Coming to America? I've seen the first Coming to America. My mom's seen the second one, but she says she didn't like it. Yeah, the the second one's not as good as as the first one. But, and and the reason I do this, right? So again, we'll go back to folklore, okay? It's an expressive body of culture shared by a particular group of people encompassing the traditions common to that culture, right? So when I see it coming to America, half of y'all like, what the fuck is that, right? But I knew out of um, Tiana, Jasper, and, and Dwayne, one of them heard of coming to America, right? So it's particular to a certain group, right? And I'm sure there's things um, within the indigenous culture that is particular to your culture that your parents make sure that you pass down, right? So the, um, it plays out in the same way. And although there may be nuances that separate certain cultures, the idea of passing down one element to, of culture to the next generation is the centerpiece, right? And all cultures have this desire to make sure that you pass down what your parents taught you to your children, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you guys have children yet, um, but I'm curious, 
what is something that your parents told you that you would make sure that you would tell your children? Respect Say it one more time, Mark. Respect. Respect. Uh, like, treat people how you want to be treated. So the golden rule, right? Okay. What else? Who, who else has something that was instilled in them by their parents that you were going to make sure to instill into your children? Um, for me, oh. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Carla. No, it's okay. You can go. Oh, I was going to say that for me, um, one thing I have that I want my kids to have is um, Spanish, the ability to speak Spanish, because um, all my family is Spanish speaking. So I feel like that's really important for them to have at least. So Claudia, can I ask you a question? Um, what do you think would get lost if you weren't able to pass the ability to speak down to uh, Spanish down to your children? Um, family family would become I think would be really lost I have a cousin um he's my uh I have a cousin and his parents never taught him Spanish and when we have family reunions or we all go visit visit Mexico he's just in the background listening to everybody but he can't communicate with anyone so it's kind of sad to see and also when you learn a language from so young it that's not it's not just like you speaking a translation or trying to understand what they're saying is also there has it's kind of funny to say but there's also soul in that language and you're communicating in a way that you can't learn even if you like if you learn Spanish in high school it's not the same as learning it when you're a, a kid and growing up with it it's completely different yeah th those nuances become important and I, I think that's what you when you call it the soul another way to articulate that is, is those nuances yeah is um but one thing I would passed down to my kids would be Spanish. Oh, very good point. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Carla, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say exactly what Claudia said, is like um, making sure they are, they are bilingual. Just like my parents always told me pass that down because it's not like the tradition or like the way we communicate is going to be like completely different. So yeah, that's one thing Yeah, I want to make sure I pass down. Absolutely. Thank you, Carla. Um, just looking at the chat, uh, Mark was saying that um, there's always something to do, which means never to be lazy and find productive things throughout the day, right? So yeah, ab absolutely. Um, there's always something that you can be doing, right? So there's no reason to be um, idle, right? You, you got there's always some work to be done. Do you want to add to that, Mark, or, or is that sufficient? Uh, yeah, you pretty much said everything. My dad, uh, my dad is very, is very like a productive guy, and then he doesn't really like sitting down for too long sometimes. And he always finds something to do and he has he passed it down to us and I want to pass that pass that down to my kids because um, no offense to anyone but there's a lot of people who are like lazy sometimes and I mean it's sometimes good to be lazy but it's not too lazy there's always like, things to do around the house or for yourself or just make a little bit of money or something like that. Yeah this is this idea of a work ethic right and yeah. Work ethic can be applied in various elements of your life, right? How, how you go about your schoolwork, it tests to your work ethic. How you show up at work, right? That attests to your work ethic. Um, how you maintain and take care of your house, that it takes test to your work ethic. Um, Isaac, Isis, excuse me. Um, why don't you go ahead and, and mention what you're putting in the chat? Well, I mentioned that like, if I were to have kids, I would pass down manners, especially like, like having respect because I f not no offense to but I feel like a lot of people don't really have so much manners or respect for anyone. It's kind of like they just do whatever they want to do, and it, a lot of people only care about themselves. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I start telling my kids like um, because of the lack of manners in this world, the ability to use them will get you a lot far, right? Because just the simple please, thank you, excuse me, will open all kind of doors for you. So that's, that's a very very good point. Um, anybody else? Any funds of knowledge that you would pass down to your future children? Uh, can I go? Yeah, please. Uh, I'd probably pass on to my kids that ignore or appreciate what they have because, as a, well, me as a kid too, my parents would always tell me that to appreciate what I got because I always wanted a lot of things. And every time they tell me, oh, well, at home you got this, this, and this to do, why, why do you need that? And I never thought about it until well, just recently growing up that like, 
it's true I didn't need those things because I always had things like I had other things that I had you know so just, just appreciating the little things that you have because you you don't need it all yeah that's a really good point Victor um I'm, I'm telling y'all I'm put you up on game with something though as a father right it's it's it's, it's weird because here it becomes like a um somewhat of a contradiction, right? So it's your job to give your kids more than what you were, expo were exposed to, right? So like, you should be able to put yourself in a position to, um, you know, provide for your kids better than you were provided for, right? Um, but what happens, it makes what Victor's talking about a little bit difficult, right? Because for me, my parents weren't in a position financially just to give me anything that they wanted, right? So that taught me to value what I have. That taught me the ability to understand work ethic to what Mark was talking about, right? But I may be now in a better position than what my kids may now be in a better position than where I was at their age, right? So literally, if I wanted to, I could kind of give them the things that they asked for, right? But what that does, if I, if I were to do that, it stifles or it, it suppresses what Victor's talking about, because if they get everything that they ask for, then they become spoiled, right? So it's, it's this dance that you have to do as a parent to kind of provide them a better life and provide them the things that they want and need, right? But then not making those spoiled ass kids. So that, that's that's the the dance that you have to do it when it comes to parenting. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right, Victor. You have, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, it's like, you gotta work for what you have. Like you gotta earn the earn the thing. And that's it. Like some that's something else my parents said. Um, like they because they are they came from from a different country, so they might really hate. It. And like people, um, they always like say they want a better life for us, but they're not just gonna give us things because we gotta earn them. So they get good and get grades, behaving good and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, John, did you want to, um, I see you posted in the chat. Did you want to comment? Uh, yeah. Um, like I said, respect, um, everyone for who they are and where they came from. Cause like, I have some friends that like, don't, uh, respect, um, let's, I'm gonna be honest. They don't respect whites. Cause you know, like, you know, we've learned to like hate them for specific reasons. Some people. But uh, honestly, like, uh, like I've met so many like non uh, brown black people that are really nice, like not all of them are like bad and like, you know, so like just to learn to respect everyone for their personality and who they are, not for what they are and and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, but for me, I, I like to provide context. Right. So there's a difference between. Um, not respecting white folks for who they are and then um being critical of the history of the historical baggage or the privilege that white people are able to enjoy right so you could be critical of their privilege you could be critical of their historical baggage but you can still respect them right so the the two aren't mutually um, they, they're not one and the same, right? They, they there is a separation in, in place, right? I could not like the way that white folks inherited their wealth and privilege, right? I could not like the history of what white folks have done, but I could respect and inter interact with white folks at a at a um, wholesome or amicable level, right? And and I think that's what John is getting to. Um, but I, I do want to make sure that you draw this distinction, though, that you could be critical and still be respectful, right? Um, Isis, I noticed that you threw some things in the chat. Did you want to comment on that also, or are you good? I can comment on it. Okay. Um, I think it's really important to like remain humble, no matter like what you have, like not be really arrogant, because I noticed that a lot, especially with like people who I was friends with. Like we would, we could both have the same thing, and one person can act so arrogant about it. And I don't know, I feel like when people are humble, it makes me respect them more and, and like like them more and like obviously want to talk to them more. When, when someone's arrogant, I really don't like talking to them. Yeah, yeah no, that's a, a, even for myself, that was a really big life lesson that I had to lose a lot of stuff that was important to me um, to understand the importance of humility. So I, I, I completely agree. 
Um, let's shift the conversation a little bit, unless anybody else wants to chime in. Um, yes, yeah, 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 that's a good one, Mark. So let me ask you a question, Mark. Do you do the cooking and cleaning at your house? Yes. Yeah. I have a, my, my just being the one take place. I have um, four, of, uh, four of the siblings. So we all like, contribute to the house. We all have specific chores what to do with it, you know, inside the restrooms, cooking. We each have a day to cook. The whole family, we each have a day to clean. Is your siblings um, all brothers, brothers and sisters? What's the dynamic? I have two older sisters and two younger brothers. And, and that, that's really dope because, um, not to generalize, but I know that there's a thing prevalent in the indigenous community of, you know, the machismo type of, of personality. And that's dope that your parents are kind of instilling in, in both. Oh, well, this is the right the uh, cook and clean. Uh, my, my parents' backgrounds are very like machismo and stuff like that. So they want to derive their, their future parents and, and kids and stuff like that um, away from that. And not like all oh, the woman has to be in the kitchen and the men have to be outside. Um, sometimes me, my dad and I work on cars while my mom and my sister like go inside and cook still, but um, we like mix around a lot. Like sometimes yeah. they're out doing whatever, and then me and my dad are cooking. Yeah, that's that's really dope, man. And I think too, it's quite apropos to the month. Um, today is National International Women's Day, right? Um, so it kind of speaks to that that reality as well. Um, so I, yeah, that's really that's really good to hear, man. Hats off to your parents for making that a part of your um, upbringing. Um, that's something that I, I'm really big on in my house. Also, like I don't have a problem cooking. I don't have a problem folding laundry. Right. Um, I just you do what's necessary to make sure that the house is functioning the way that it's supposed to. Right. There's not a thing yeah. about this is what women. Wash, should, you know, like washing your own clothes or washing the restroom, washing your bed, everything here, your room. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. How to survive, how to, pretty much how to, they're teaching us how to survive on our own if they're not here. Yeah. So, yeah, again, man, hats off to Mr. and Mrs. Escobar for that. Um, let, let's shift a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm curious to what you guys thought about the books or, or the text method, right? Like how she chose to articulate those words. Um, did you find the method effective, right? The, the language that she chose to write the text in. Um, did that work for you? Did that not work for you? Did it make it more confusing? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Um, I mean, personally, it was a bit confusing because it was more like more like slang. It's, it sounded like more like slang um, language, and it was I understood like some of it, but some of them I had to like read and read like two or three times over. Like okay, like this, oh, this is what this sentence meant or something. Like that. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, it was super um, difficult to read. I stuttered like a lot. Um, and a lot of times when I'm reading, I have to kind of read out loud to kind of get a good, a good sense of what the plot is. Um, and reading out loud was very difficult. <laughs> um, like I said, I kept stuttering over the words and I did have to read like, like Mark um, a couple of sentences over. Yeah. But I thought yeah. it was very interesting. And it wasn't even just like the, 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 um, everything in quotes that were like the dialogue that was um, slang. It was also the narration of it, which I thought was interesting. That was also in slang. Um, hold, hold on, Dwayne, because that's a good point. I want to make sure everybody is hearing what he said, because I, that's a brilliant point. So what Dwayne is saying, right, is not only what was in quotes that he noticed that was like slang, but even the way that she wrote from a narrative standpoint was in that slang dialect as well, right? So that's an important methodical move. Right. So she could have very well put what she heard someone else say in that language. Right. And that slang language and then still wrote academic for her narration. But she chose to place everything in that slang. What do you guys think is the significance of that? Why do you think she chose to do that? Um, I think it helped like bring the story to life, like actually help uh, like experience what she was going through. Absolutely, Alex. It. Um, it displaces the reader. Do you guys understand what I, what I mean when I say it displaces the reader? So it takes you from your living room, your kitchen, your bedroom, and it places you in Kissimmee, Florida, 
right? So you're engulfed in the way that they di um, dialogue and the way they engage each other in conversation, right? So this is a, a mood of method that Dwayne is pointing out. Very good point, Dwayne. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, bro, but that was, I just want to make sure everybody understood that. No, it's cool. It's cool. Um, but yeah, the slang of the that was used in this story was um, difficult to understand, and I kind of found myself losing the the plot. Um, so I had to like really, really pay attention. And I told my group about this in the breakout rooms, but I think that this, uh, this reading was one of the most difficult readings to kind of dissect and try to understand. Yeah, I agree. That's why I try to give you guys the heads up, but it's really no way to um, prepare you for it than just to have you go through it. But I mean, just imagine reading 295 pages of that, right? That's just, y'all just got a chapter. I had to read a whole damn book. But it is very difficult, um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. You find yourself losing the message as you're trying to keep up with what's being said, right? And, and I think that's also part of um, her method because, and you guys didn't get this information, but essentially what she does, um, she goes to um, France Boas, her, her mentor at the University of Columbia, and she says, you know, I wanna produce this text of folklore, right? And I, I wanna go back to my hometown and I wanna hear the stories that I was told growing up and I wanna document those and put them into a book, right? So this is, this is her desire. So just as we're interpreting these stories, right? And trying to make sense while interpreting the language at the same time, that's something that she was having to go through. Right. So she's hearing these people tell these stories. And of course, she's a little bit more familiar with the dialect because she comes from there. But this is she's removed. Right. It's, it's the um, equivalent of being a native Spanish speaker. Right. And you still understand Spanish. But if you lived outside of Mexico for a while. Right. You have to kind of use your muscles to understand a little bit more a little bit more. Right. So she's kind of again, this notion of displacing displacement she's putting us in the position that she was in, right? So you have to interpret what's being said while simultaneously understanding the story. And she makes that a part of her method. Um, anyone else, comments, questions, concerns about the method? Effective, ineffective, or even a passage from the text that really stood out to you. I think I, th I think it was like effective. Uh, well, I think it was both effective and effective. Mostly effective because it um, she put us she put us in her shoes, trying to under trying to make us understand like the whole aspect and trying to put us through like this journey or roller coaster what she went through and trying to experience the full experience of it. Well, so just a little bit ineffective because. Sometimes um, it's hard to read, and it's getting to experience it firsthand is, um, I guess, is better to understand than experience it through readings. I guess, just me personally. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you guys: Who do you think her audience is? Who do you think that she wrote this book for? Because that's also would speak to possibly why she wrote the book the way that she did, right? Why she chose not to use your standard academic jargons in the book. Who do you think this book is for? I would say for the people down south, like the people that she went to study, so she can earth, so they can realize that their stories or their folklore, they're not the only ones that exists, that there's multiple versions that exist. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Victor, right? She's writing it for the people who's studying, but I, I think also there's a dual, actually, before I put that on, before I say my piece, anybody else want to add to, to what they think, who the audience is? Okay, so I, I think Victor's absolutely right. Right, that she she wants to um, situate or center 
a group of people who have always been marginalized, right? So not only do you rarely, in 1935, okay, so let's be concept, conscious of what the time that we're talking about. So in 1935, it's rare to see anybody Black in any type of academic text, book, anything, right? That's a rarity. So it's even more rare, right, to have these real Southern Black populations centered in academic focus, right? So one, she's putting people who are on the margin historically in the center as one of the methods, right? But then two, to Victor's point, he's showing, she, she is showing that there's other aspects of knowledge out there, right? That there's this whole folklore that's out in the world that people are making sense of the war, world with that isn't being paid attention to, right? So while she is writing to this certain segment of people, she's critiquing a whole nother area of people, people who exist within the universities and the schools, right? Who don't wanna pay attention to the type of knowledge that's being produced in the South, right? Through um, black folks in the deep, deep South, right? So it's a double move at play. I'm writing to you, the people who I'm studying, that's why I'm gonna use your vernacular, right? But I'm showing the people of where I come from, I'm showing the people from the academy, I'm showing the people from Columbia, Harvard, and all these academic institutions that there's knowledge that's being produced in this area that you ignore, right? So again, um, I believe it was in this class when I talked about how funds of knowledge was developed, right? It was, it was developed as a counter to a theory that was produced by a French philosopher, Pierre Bordeaux, who says that uh, European students are able to achieve academic success because of their cultural capital, right? The ability to go to museums, the ability to go to the opera, right? These are the things that allow students of, in European descent to be academically successful. So Tara Yasso, Yoso, excuse me, who created this idea of funds of knowledge said, well, hold on, Bordeaux, right? There's also these knowledges that are taking place in these communities that you're ignoring, right? Um, and so I'm gonna highlight these knowledges by calling this theory funds of knowledge, right? So this is the same thing that's at play here within Hurston, right? He said, yeah, naturally, right? There's these, um, the written tradition of the Greeks and the Romans, right? We understand how Western world has their epistemology. It's essentially, epistemology is knowledge, right? We understand that lineage. But there's also a lineage that comes from the oral tradition that you're not recognizing. So let me go study this oral tradition. Think again to the words of Glissant, right? The confrontation between the oral and the written, right? The oral being the cries that of the enslaved that were stifled, right? The written being the ledgers that said how much that each person is valued. The confrontation between the oral and the written. Hurston is picking up the same confrontation, right? So while you're saying that the European knowledge is validated by them having it written down, right? I'm saying that the African and indigenous knowledge is just as important because it's spoken. Right, And the individual who is tasked with carrying down the tradition of these folklore, with the tradition of these um, generational knowledge, is what we call the griot, right? Or, with they, or within the stories that um, Hurston told, Dad Boykin, right? They were called the elder's dad, right? It's, it serves the same purpose, being able to pass down stories that help you make sense of the world. It's the purpose of folklore. Um, let's hear a few more ideas on what do you think if, it, if the uh, method was effective? Any general thoughts you had about the reading? No one had any other thoughts about the reading? Well, like they had mentioned, I feel like it was a little difficult because it was a different like way that it was written. So it was just a little difficult to read. I had to reread and I had to read all out too. And my mom walked in and she was like, what are you saying? And I was just like, I'm trying to read. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, definitely um, reading out loud. And I, I really tried to in, um, emphasize this, but reading out loud, it, it really does um, help you understand, right? Because 
I, I don't know, for me, when I read to myself, like if it's a word that I don't know, I just skip past it and, and just, you know, it just doesn't appear, right? But if you're reading out loud, you're forced to kind of deal with that word because it's gonna break up the flow of your reading. So um, one is just good practice reading out loud. It, it helps you to um, really become a better reader. Um, yeah, yeah, I says, I, try it on the next reading. I just, I, and again, I suggest everyone just try reading out loud. You'll see a, a vast difference um, in how you're able to understand and digest the information. Does anybody listen to audiobooks? So think about um, reading out loud as an audiobook, right? It's your own voice, but it does the same exact thing that it happens when you read via audiobooks, right? It has the same cognitive process. So I, I definitely recommend that. Um, Let's see. Give me one second, you guys. I'm going to show you what our reading is for next week. Um, bear with me. So for next week's reading, yeah, we're gonna do uh, James Baldwin, Going to Meet the Man. So keep in mind though, the three separate PDFs, that's all one reading, okay? So you wanna read each of these. Um, it's a little bit longer, but this is a lot more clearer to read. Um, it's not written you know, with, with that slang. Um, so this should be a little bit easier for you guys to digest. Um, but just keep in mind, though, it's three separate PDFs, and all of those PDFs are for um, the James Baldwin text, Going to Meet the Man. Um, so one, two, three. And so we're going from folklore to story. And this is from a collection of stories that, that um, Baldwin wrote. Uh, I'm going to give you what they call a, um, what they call a shit, a, um, trigger warning, right? Like it deals with some very explicit content, but you know, we're, we're all adults here, we're all intellectuals. So we're gonna deal with the content at an intellectual level, um, but just be, be aware it's dealing with um, lynchings and, and things of that nature. So it, it's a different, um, different read from a content standpoint than what we've engaged so far. Um, also, be attentive to the fact that we're kind of moving into more contemporary times, right? So we're going from the 1930s um, to the 1960s, okay? So we're moving about 30 years into the um, future from jumping from Hurston to Baldwin. And um, we're going to kind of keep getting more and more contemporary as we move throughout the semester. Um, is there any questions that anyone has for me? Let me, one more thing. I just want to double check on a possible date for our midterms. Give me one second. Um, So um, this section we'll get through, and then sometime during our next section will be our midterm. So um, here, I'll show you one more time. So we're currently here, weeks eight through 11, um, Hurston, Baldwin, Morrison, right? And then this next section will be our midterm. So, probably what we'll do is we'll read Baldwin. I don't know if we'll read um, Morrison, but probably what we'll do is not read Morrison. We'll do the midterm review, and then we'll have the midterm before we start this section. So- Wait, Sorry, so that's gonna be after, after we come back to spring break, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, it'll be after spring break. All right. Uh, is there any other questions that you guys